will take a decade. Some UK farmers actually fear they will lose out. Others, with India and the Gulf states, for example, which remain under discussion, may also have a small impact, although they are growing in importance. However, without deals with the biggest players, the US, which accounts for a sixth of our trade, and China, of course, we're unlikely to see Brexit leading to a major boost to the amount we sell abroad anytime soon. Now, everyone traded less during the pandemic, but other rich nations there in grey saw their trade bouncing back more quickly than the UK's. And that's the red line there. So, for now at least, global trade has become a smaller part of our economy. And there's also investment. This is where it could be if it had continued growing at the same rate as before the referendum. That's according to academics at King's College in London. But in reality, it's stalled. Some economists, such as those at the International Monetary Fund, claim Brexit-related uncertainty is deterring spending on things like factories, training and equipment. Other analysts at the briefings for Britain think tank claim the UK has simply resumed a longer-term pattern of underinvesting. Ultimately, it all reduces our chances of becoming a more efficient, higher-earning country. As for jobs, well, the end of free movement equals 330,000 fewer workers in the UK. Just 1% of the workforce, but the absence of EU workers is hitting some sectors harder. It may be equal to as many as 8% of transport workers, 4% of hospitality staff and 3% of retail workers, causing shortages. And all of this may be one reason why the UK is the only major rich economy that's actually smaller, poorer than before the pandemic. But it's still early days and there's much yet to be settled, not just the Northern Ireland Protocol, but also permanent arrangements for industries like financial services, fishing, and electric vehicles. There are potential gains there. How much we achieve will be up to politicians.